Welcome to Cartoonist Kayfabe. My name's Ed Piscor. I'm Jim Rugg. We're going to be talking about an important one for the 90s comic book kids. Jimmy, but first, what do you got for us? I have patreon.com slash Jim Rugg. I'm showing off two Street Angel comics here because I realized this is Lost Dog Story, the free comic book day story. This was the first Street Angel story, the one you're flipping through, yeah. that I did when I started with Image Comics. The Lost Dog is the last complete Street Angel story that I did at Image, you know, for this block of books for Deadly Girl Live. So I'm going through on my Patreon and doing a comparison. I love the comparison videos that we shoot of, like, Conan most recently. Right. And uh, This is basically going to be kind of, you know, comparison, not a video, but a series of posts, and, uh, and just notes on those comparisons. You can see uh, quite a range, you know, over a couple of years in between these, about 200 pages between these two issues, and... Uh, a lot of different materials, different processes, and, you know, just different as a cartoonist. In the beginning, very similar, different style, but very similar story. Uh, the story changes, too, as it goes on. So I'll point out all that and kind of get into my thinking and just different mindset over the course of a couple years. Why the fuck aren't we doing a video on this, Jimmy? <laughs> Good question. <laughs> but you all at home can catch it on patreon.com slash Jim Rugg. Red Room Issue 1 is going to be out in the wild in short order, coming out in mid-May. Uh, your store can start ordering this sucker at the, uh, at the end of February, but you can pre-order it right at this very moment. Thousands of people have done so already. I have a link tree in the description below where you could hit those links to the Fantagraphics site to pre-order it. You could also hit patreon.com slash edpiscor uh, and check out the comics as I am serializing them. Uh, two strip... Two pages come out per week. I have two issues of Red Room up there right at this minute. Three bucks get you the archive, and I want to give shouts to all the patrons who have supported uh, that part of the process already. Anyhow, Jimmy, with that stuff out of the way, let's talk about some of the most important comics to our uh, young lives as we got deeper and deeper into uh, comics fandom, into uh, these creators... We did a video very recently on uh, Spider-Man 1. Uh, Todd McFarlane came out uh, around this time. Yes. And uh, we made mention of that being very important for the speculation boom. I think this was very important for the speculation boom. Uh, certainly helped out New Mutants and X-Factor a whole lot because I was a young boy grabbing comics at the uh, local convenience store. X-Men's were reliable you could get those month in, month out, no problem. So who knows what the numbers were on those books. And what's that old saying? The rising tide raises all boats. This is a this is Keebler Elf cookies, man. Like, this is a product. And when you have a crossover like this, the real point is, let's try to increase some numbers for New Mutants. Let's try to increase some numbers for X-Factor. That's the only point of I this think, nonsense. I think X-Factor is the great benefactor out of this out of this group, because as you say, X-Men is... I don't know that you're selling any extra X-Men based on the storyline, but I did buy all nine of these. This is probably a year, year and a half into my comics reading. I'm still buying off the newsstand. Jim Lee had come on. Do you realize Jim Lee's regular assignment starts like 268? So he just joins X-Men... It's a phenomena, his art style. And uh, this was super hot. Uh, you know, the New Mutants were certainly rising. Liefeld had been there for, I don't know, eight issues, nine issues. Cable, same thing. Um, I think that book was building momentum too. X-Factor feels like the old X group of, the, of this, of this uh, series. And I think shortly after this, Wills Portatio joins X-Factor. But at this point, not yet. You know, like it was kind of a... It needed a little attention, X Factor, and this crossover really did it. I was super pumped into this at the time, and I hadn't read it since. So this will be a, this was a fun <laughs> week going back through this series. Um, but definitely, I think probably a lot of people watching at home remember this. This was such a big. This was my first big X crossover as a reader, and and, and that was cool. That was really awesome. You know, first time through seeing all these characters interacting with each other, seeing the artists going from issue to issue. I, I dug it. You know, it's, there's a reason that these crossovers continue to this day, um, probably diminishing returns as a reader, but the first experience was pretty cool. And this would be maybe the third or fourth mutant crossover in, in Marvel history. Uh, Chris Claremont, and Nocenti, Louise Simonson, you can find a video on the, with them on YouTube talking about how they kind of inadvertently uh, created the crossover 
at uh, at at Marvel uh, when Wheezy and Chris Claremont uh, sort of came up with the idea of either was it fall either follow the mutants or the mutant massacre I forget which which comes first and the whole point of that was that uh, in like one or two issues Chris was so proprietary over this stuff one or two issues I think it might have been a JRJR where they were uh, John Romita Jr. Uh, where the characters were in the the Morlock tunnel and they the artist just drew a few too many Morlocks for for Chris's uh, for Chris's uh, uh, satisfaction because he wanted the mutants to be special and to be sort of sort of rare so mutants had to die he needed he needed he needed to even those numbers out man and that was the conceit of. The early crossover, and guess what? The stuff did really well. Probably ra- boosted the sales of X Factor at the time, uh, you know, or and certainly New Mutants. Like those ki- those books are always the kind of uh, bastard children of of the the main X title. But every year, you know, it's it's a uh, mutant massacre. Follow the mutants. Uh, Was Inferno an X Men? primarily an x-men crossover that was Mar- marvel wide i do think it showed up because i remember the the daredevil issues right, that's right? what i was thinking of. so i do think it uh hit every title but it's all circles around madeline Pryor. yeah and that would have been what happened right before this yeah, right before i started reading i think is probably the timetable for inferno because i think mark silvestri's drawing the x-men at that time yes but uh, i come on at the end of his run i wish he was doing x-factor in this run that that would <laughs> certainly uh elevate this story further but it's <clears throat> we'll note some of this stuff as we go through um but i remember trade paperbacks of this storyline yeah and so like reading this now i think it read much better as like a serial over the course of three months right because there's overlap there are some sloppy like how do we keep everything consistent with different writers different artists probably producing this at a breakneck speed and so there's some of these inconsistencies and in reading it all at once they stand out and yeah. also reading them in, in this like post trade paperback graphic novel era uh, it just feels like a different kind of storytelling. But like I said, I do remember buying this as a kid, and it was exciting. Like, yeah. I wanted that next chapter when I got to the end of an issue. And, you you know, it's... McFarlane talks about this all the time. It's that excitement factor. And I don't know that we give enough credit to that. And and maybe it's because as readers, we're all collectors now. We've aged out of that. Like, I'm I'm 11, and I'm pumped for this next issue. But there was an excitement factor there. Um, that I think overcomes some of the, how, how do you write for a trade paperback? Right. You, you know, which we would see now, but a, a long evolution of that. We're on the record talking about how very, very few, you know, great collaborations in kind of corporate comics. Uh, you could count all the great ones on two hands with fingers left over. Uh, you could probably count all the good ones on <laughs> on four hands with, yeah. with, with fingers left over. All the rest is chaff. Now let's add further complication to the comics creation process because now you have to have uh, you know dueling creative teams all contribute to the same story. Louise Simonson's in the mix here as a as a writer on two titles, and uh, you know she was a writer on Superman whenever they had to coordinate. Right. All, it's like can this lady ever just write a comic <laughs> that, that she wants to make and not have to be a part of some giant cannon poor wheezy man i <laughs> you hear so many creators complain about that kind of coordinated like crossover type stuff and and yeah she's getting it at both marvel and dc hey let's talk about uh the cover of 270 for a minute good cover it's a great cover i love any of these covers that that fool with a logo get the logo involved it is great and we see havoc here which makes sense pivotal character in the storyline character that's coming back to x-men or at least the x family and uh and jim lee you know like we said fresh on X-Men and and really hitting his stride, I think, as a cartoonist, as a penciler for Marvel in this era. So pretty compelling cover. Jim Lee did that uh, did that trilogy, intro- introducing the new Psylocke character. This is the post-Siege Perilous X-Men. They come through this portal, and when they pop out, their entire world is uh, shaken. Like, every character is somehow different. By the way, when you start explaining the Siege Perilous... I'm I'm all ears, man, because it's it's never made sense to me. Talk about a weird this this book also. This is X Men. I don't know, thirteen years into Claremont's run or something. A hard book to understand everything that's going on. There are subplots that have run for years. Things like the Siege Perilous that's just impossible to explain to anyone. 
Uh, really a bizarre, strange book to be as popular as it was. Maybe that even had something to do with the popularity. Like In hindsight, I love that quality. Yeah. But, it, you know, usually when I like a book for its bizarre, weird qualities, it's not a good seller. <laughs> you know, X-Men bucks that trend. Look at this, man. She, she was on a... Lola or whatever her name is, she was working for a different network before she was working Gotham City much <laughs> many years later. Jim Lee loves some Frank Miller, man. Got one of those, these intro panels, freaking loved. I saw these before I saw the Art Adams joints, man, but that's clearly what these are in reference to. And this middle piece is a news broadcast talking about the kind of political destabilization between Genosha, this, this, uh, He's kind of sovereign nation uh, and their friction with America because what happened several issues, probably some of the last uh, Silvestri stuff and Rick Leonardi, uh, a couple of Genosian uh, mutates escape to the X mansion and arouse the X-Men to go check, check out that, that country. What the heck's going on there? And discovered that uh, there were like mutant slaves. Wait one second. I just got to point out, Jim Lee doing Cable was a big deal for me. For sure. I loved yeah. Cable. I was reading New Mutants, and it was like, Jim Lee's awesome. It was really cool to see him get hold of these characters. Part of the appeal as a fan of art was like, okay, yeah, let the hot artists draw X Factor. Let them draw K let, let them draw all these characters I like that I've never seen them draw. So that, that that's a big draw for me going into this. Jim Lee's a couple, year, uh, a couple years into his career, and uh, this is like when he starts to turn up. Like, he must... He's starting to sell original art, Jimmy. Ah, he's starting to. That's a good page. <laughs> he's starting to. Uh, he's starting to get some dollars, man, for for these pages. So, the Psylocke issues pretty much start his money shot comics, and this will continue it. You're going to see some cool cables in here. By man. the way, that Psylocke issues we're going to need to look at. Yeah, that's a great trilogy. But the, these are what these two page spreads are what I think of when I think of Jim Lee Uncanny X Men. Right. They were killer, man. Like month issue after issue. This would just be incredible. Yeah, and he sells it good, man. This is a young, because of the Siege Perilous, like, Storm comes through, she's a little kid. And uh, he, he sells, I mean, this is like proto-Gen 13 type. One thing that happens in this storyline is Storm is going to go from being a kid to being an adult. That's almost impossible for most monthly cartoonists to draw. Jim Lee does really well with it, I think. Yeah. They're basically testing young Storm's powers out, man. She was gone from the X-Men for a while. She hooked up with some uh, mysterious character called Gambit. She's back. Yeah, her and Gambit's partnership was real fun to get little hints of in this. Because I, I, I remember reading that part, too. And that's one of those storylines that's kind of cool. Like, they're this thief team. The little fun. thief, The little thief posse. But here's the deal, Jimmy. We're hot off the heels, man, of the Australian Outback team. And the mansion got filled up. Uh, nature pours a vacuum. So the new mutants started to uh, live in the X-Mansion. X-Men are back. And they're fighting over the uh, danger room here, dude. Yeah, and what's left of the X-Mansion, by the way? I think it's leveled at this point, And they're all living in the, in the sub-levels. <laughs> <laughs> and there it is. That's what I wanted in this. I needed to see Jim Lee do a really killer cable. And that's one of the good shots of, of him. And look at that arm. All the stuff on the arm. Also, I live for that. Jimmy, it's a it's a kicking in the door shot. Right. <laughs> Look how happy the smug the new mutants are. <laughs> Nobody ever gets along. You do these crossovers and everybody has to be tough with each other. Yeah, one thing that I liked about like rereading this is the amount of kind of character mm -hmm. that uh, Claremont is able to get in there with just a mere sentence. With I don't know the, about the mere sentence. Well, I'm talking about like one word balloon because we, how much dialogue is Richter going to get in an, in an issue? You know That's what I'm saying, man? Too so, much. <laughs> However much he gets, it's too much. So uh, that that's that's one of the strengths of. Uh, I think that's something he did better than any of the other writers of any of these X books that followed him or contemporaries. Like he he wrote a lot of words on a page, right? But he did seem to really want to have these characters be characters sure give, yeah. give them something give them personality uh, we got guido or as i used to call him uh, at this time guido because i never saw uh, th that string of uh letters together before that's a fun character he's going to show up on the x factor team when they reboot it in in i guess next year 90 91 this is 1990 so 91 i think is when the teams get shuffled um, it was interesting to see him here because I don't feel like they have plans for what the X books are going to look like a year from no, now. Yeah. That's a big deal when they relaunch and shuffle teams. 
cool to see him show up. I always liked his character design. Yeah, for sure. Uh, definitely a Bill Sienkiewicz uh, design, and you get to see Sylvester draw him. Mm -hmm. You get to see Jim Lee draw him here. You get to see Larry Stroman draw him later on, and it's it's a wild character. Always fun to see Jim Lee deviate from the norm yes. of what of what he draws. And a lot of times when a character's weird like that, everybody draws them poorly. Right. All those artists you name do a really good, strong guy. <laughs> Uh, it, it's it's kind of the, uh, the the one that breaks the rule that he's he always looks pretty cool. Still retaining a touch of the uh, the Jim Shooter era stuff with the, with the uh, little retrospect pieces here, man. It seemed like every issue, Jean Grey crying about like, when I died, I died a long time ago, and now I'm back, and then I was cloned, but I'm back, and the clone's <laughs> dead. When yeah, coming through the siege perilous havoc, who was part of the Outback team. When he rematerializes in uh, in this time span or whatever, he's now a Genosian uh, magistrate, which is one of the very odd pieces because they're so kind of anti mutant or like put put these mutants to work, but they let him wield guns and uh, rock his power. He is he is the most hated version of uh, the of the mutants in Genosha in that he volunteers to serve the state, is why he doesn't get mind wiped like like the worst of the worst in terms of traitors to the mutant Here it population. Is. This yes. is one of the greatest piece of, pieces of advertising awesome. that, that like, I have to acknowledge as like totally working on me. You know, I read the comic. Loved it. Then you go to Toys R Us and you take a look at the, at the actual package for the game. And on the back of the game, it says, uh, shows one image of this monster. It's a big head popping out of the ground. Looks like pizza cheese on top of its head. And it said, can you defeat the maggot eating boss? And I was like, I want to, I got to try. I like, I want to try to be, so it's like, this got me to look at it. And then that back cover sold me on, on the thing. And I mean, Christmas this year, well, I would have gotten. This is really Turbo iconic. Graphics. And Marvel has a history of these iconic centerfold two page uh, ads. You, the ones I always think of are like the Saturday morning, yeah. the new Saturday morning season. And you'll have like all the shows, a little, a uh, little image, but you can see this is done Marvel bullpen. So guys watching this at home, tell us who the creative team is here. You know, is, is this Rick Parker doing letters? Uh, who's drawing this thing? Because that's a good haunted house. I think you could probably uh, give this some some thought and figure out who the artists are on display here. But yeah, this is one of my favorite of all those centerfold ads. Man, there's a lot of content in this first issue. Yeah, they got to set things up, man. They're now above ground. The new mutants. Uh, the actually, they're they're above ground. They're kind of frolicking. It's post Danger Room workout. The adults are down below. Kids are upstairs. Enter the Genosians. This sovereign nation is now on American soil fucking with the X-Men. And how about that intro piece, right? That's dope. Yes, yeah. Yeah, Jim Lee, like I said, man, this is my favorite era of Jim Lee. Like, he's on top of his game. He's young, energetic, and probably trying, you know, panels like this. Might be the first time he, ha he does a panel like that. He's really good at these kind of mechanical mech designs yes. and we'll see another really good example as we uh move forward but they are getting they are getting blitzed yes by uh, these genotians and the people down below forge cable all those guys they don't quite know what's even happening yeah it all happens pretty quick they they convey that well storm does a move here in a page or two where she throws the non-mutant down the hatch and then like seals off the hatch there's one of those cool one of those cool mech shots. Look at that for a two-page spread. That's some Wildstorm stuff right there. I mean, this would be a character in Stormwatch. Yeah, or any a number of those team books. <laughs> right. Have a big heavy mech in all yeah, of them. Yeah, so there's Stevie Hunter. Send her down. Cable catches her. Uh, so <laughs> Out of my way, woman. <laughs> good, good, good dialogue, Chris. There's a lot of that, man, with Cable. Like, mm -hmm. uh, he, he doesn't let anybody forget their nationalities. Hey, Irish... He's uh, he's very abrasive. Yeah. I think that all the uh, I think everybody, at least the writers, the old school writers, didn't like Cable. You, you know, like even if you read Wizard, you can see like there, Cable personified a certain type of comics, a revolution in comics, and a lot of people hated that character. I really like this panel right yeah, here, man, with the flying characters heading heading uh, heading upstairs. It's a great vertical. I think this first issue sets up a really compelling story. You know, putting this a whole nation after them. Oh, you know what I was going to point out is I, I like seeing Warlock drawn by different artists, especially stylists like a Jim Lee. It's cool to see that character uh, filtered through his pen. 
it's a hard char- it's a hard character to put into a story like this uh, because the character is Deus Ex Machina. It could turn into the Starship Enterprise and, and fly you out there. So we're gonna have to do something about that. Boom! Shot this boy, fucked him up a little bit, and they captured him. So at the end of uh, at the end of the issue, Wolf's Bane, Rain, Storm, and Richter, and Warlock are all and Boom Boom and Boom Boom. Yes, yes, all all taken away. The flying characters, they finally make it. Dude, that's also a cool thing to tell you on how subterranean the danger room is. It's like they're flying up for three pages worth and finally uh, pop out. When they hit the ground, they don't know where any of the kids are. They have no idea what was happening up there. They just got a couple of trinkets left behind, a couple of guns or whatever. Uh, Pretty sure that uh, Genosha is responsible for that. So that's that's your setup. It's a good setup. It's I think it's the most compelling issue of this whole run. And you know what happens is just coordination. You start handing this off to other writers, other creators, you're trying to like hit certain checkpoints. It it falls off a little bit. Yeah. You know, I, I, it's smart to give it to Claremont to start it. Yeah. Um cuz he has those characters and this subplot kind of already built in and seems very comfortable with it. As we go on, man, the wheels come off. I you know, it's, I'm picturing a race car that's like crashing slowly and things are going wrong and pretty soon it's on fire. That's kind of how this feels to me. But that first issue, I think, is strong. Yeah. It even ends with next month, it's Wolvie's turn. Right. Which, loved it. <laughs> so in Genosha, the mutates here, they kind of, uh, they get specific mute, mutates to kind of harness resources. So there might be like a mutant that could create lithium ion batteries, you know, willy nilly or something like that. And they export this stuff. So every other sort of neighboring nation that handles exports from there with a, from, with a very good price, they're not looking too close to figure out how Genosha gets that stuff. No, gross mutant, uh, mutant rights violations. Yeah. This is the naked Rob Liefeld fight scene issue man <laughs> uh by rob liefeld and co uh honestly i think the co does a lot of the heavy lifting i i think that rob probably does very very minimal breakdowns you could kind of see his hand i mean you know these you, the terror the horror what what was done to these poor mutants i mean they cut their arms off and something else on poor richter you know what there's nothing hanging down there it's so there's gonna be all these funny crops uh, this whole, this whole say issue. funny crotches. <laughs> <laughs> Both. Reintroduction of the Cameron Hodge character, who was like a friend of X Factor back in the day. Uh, the X Factor team was it's a it's a weird comic to start. Uh, the the X Factor characters were like Ghostbusters, except the mutant version. So you call X Factor, they show up to eradicate the mutants, but they really whisper into the mutants ear, hey, like. We'll take you here. We'll we'll hook you up. Don't worry. We have to just pretend like we're anti mutant. And he was the leader of that team until Archangel gets created and, and chops off his head. So he now now he's back and he's part of this uh, machine. And uh, it is real funny that like the president of a country meets this guy, part of this thing, and it's like, yeah, I'm I'm willing to do business with you. All right. So I'm glad you explained who Hodge is. This character is the main villain of this story big time too. Like not just as a figurehead or a concept of like we're going to enslave the mutants or something. He is like the, the the heavy, the muscle. He's everything. And it's the most ludicrous character design of any major character I can think of. And we'll keep pointing it out. Because yeah. I don't know if he's ever drawn the same way. No. But also it's just bizarre. Like this human head on a, a damn near indestructible robotic body really peculiar yeah like with all of these crossovers executioner song any of these things you got to create some generic like you're not killing magneto in this a crossover like this you know you introduce some goofball uh r- try to raise the stakes a bunch and then you could kill him off I- and uh, there's no there's no major consequences a lot of good color on this by the way man we're in the magenta room all right, so this starts a pattern. What's going to happen is we're going to see these characters stripped of their mutant powers. Yes. And that's going to just repeat. Like every character you like in the X-Men is going to go through this process over about the next four or five issues of this crossover. Uh, it, it's a little tough. Yeah. It's it's very overwhelming what the uh, the Genotians have in terms of their ability to handle the X-Men. Yeah. Like they basically have no problems destroying the X-Men. Their problem is that some people on the inside turn against them 
Otherwise, it's like they would have wiped out the mutants very easily, very handily, like yes. in three months. <laughs> <laughs> There's a character called Wipeout who's one of these uh, Genosian uh, mutates, and he also looks different uh, depending on if Rob <laughs> Liefeld's drawing him, if uh, Bogdanov's drawing him, or Jim Lee. And he's also a very uninspired design, let's say. <laughs> Just a fat dude. All, all three of the designs. I'm telling you, he's not always a fat guy. <laughs> For real. Uh, one of their big characters is... Gene Engineer, is that how you would say his name? Dr. Moreau. <laughs> yes, Dr. Moreau. <laughs> Dr. Moreau, yes. Uh, crossing over from the literature classics into Genosha, and uh, he's sort of the guy who, who strips these mutants of their identity to make them robotic-like slaves of the state. Yeah. What a dark character. We introduce... A lot of Nazi references throughout this storyline. For sure, yes. And uh, when Genosha was first introduced, they introduced like new kind of like mutant epithets. Uh, this one being a gene joke. You're yes. going to hear over and over again. Yeah, that's the uh, alliterative tip of the hat on how to pronounce Genosha for me. Ah, uh, right. So poor, poor Warlock, man. Worse for the wear, like all the other captives gave him a little bit of energy to help it with the escape but he got jacked up even further to the point that they have to leave him behind mm. and that's one of those things you gotta it's like uh, akira when kaneda gets the big laser gun it runs out of batteries you gotta get the most powerful character to run out of batteries or else the story's over how about that run pose right there <laughs> When, miss, I think we're missing something there, Ed. When you when you see this ink like that, I, I do feel like that, that the anchor's dissing you. <laughs> you know, they're not helping you out, man. Yeah, that's that's tough. So these characters escape powerless. They they basically all go their own ways. Except Rain, she's going right back. Yeah, she doesn't want to abandon Warlock. And that is where things get dicey. This Hodge guy, he wants to siphon Warlock's powers. He's not a mutant. He's a, He's an alien, and he's got a special ability to kind of shapeshift. Hodge wants that. You know, they don't make a big production of this, but Hodge is so powerful throughout this storyline, it would be great if they explained part of that power away from what he steals from Warlock. Right. There would be a lot of great things that, uh, if they gave us anything, might increase the value of the story. Man, speaking of uh, Hodge's craziness, <laughs> look at this version of him. My With a cardboard suit hung around his neck. Wow. Yeah, man. I made sure to put that in grand design, man, because it's just, <laughs> just the weirdest thing ever, like where he's talking to people on Zoom. Yes. And uh, he gets behind that. And by if the way, I saw that on Zoom, I am just shutting down, like, reboot the computer, man. Pull pull the plug. It's a metaphor It's a metaphor for all of us, this piece right here when we do our Zoom stuff, because you know you're wearing PJ pants. <laughs> and then how about, like, Bogdanov's great contribution is the Genosian president. That really is like a hybrid between Ronald Reagan and Margaret Thatcher. In a dress, uh, power suit, very, uh, very odd character. Like, looks straight out of 2000 AD or something. Hey, I'm gonna I'm gonna throw a spoiler out here for kayfabe. I also read Doom Force this week, which yeah. is Grant Morrison's like poking fun of of image style storytelling. And when you go from like Doom Force and the character designs to things like Hodge and this president character, because she is a, she is bizarre. Yeah, it's such a weird trippy. Like I don't know who's being serious. I don't know what we're parodying. <laughs> right. It's it's uh, it's kind of fun in that way. I do it's think that they're bizarre. I do think that they're being serious as a heart attack. Uh, this is Hodge. Like he's like, oh, wait till I get my hands on you again, you mother f for decapitating me like this. Yeah, special hatred for him, and we're we're gonna see that play out. It is kind of fun that there are hard connections to X Factor, you know, like having X Factor in here. They get some they get some spotlight on them. Yeah, something tells me that Bob Harris, the X the X editor, is like, this thing needs a damn shot in the arm. Nobody's looking at these characters, and, and like they made toys of this era, like Cyclops. And that's the ugliest. Like shouts to Walt Simonson. Like you know, we're on record. We love them, but these character, I mean, these costume designs, whack as hell. Look at the contrast between Cyclops and and uh, and Cable sitting next to each other in terms of just design. Father and yeah, right. <laughs> very very different, miles Fa apart. Father and son. So what's happening is. Wait, did you say John Bogdanov is the artist here? Yeah. I like this issue's art. I was very pleased with a lot of this stuff. The uh, X Factor, they're they're visiting Washington, basically getting the go ahead to go off to uh, 
Genosha handle business. Uh, you know, we're going to disavow any knowledge of you being there if you get caught. But go handle that stuff. Look at I that guy. I was going to point at him. Is that supposed to be a mutant? Like, what are we seeing there? <laughs> That's just a news broadcaster. That's a weird drawing. It is. It looks. Where are his eyebrows? Uh, yeah, that's a that's a Kirby. It is Kirby. Atlas monster. Very Kirby esque. <laughs> just <Monster>. these proportions. <laughs> just these proportions. It's like it's like fashion. Like I mean, the size of these heads. Look at that little peanut head. Yeah. Yeah. This is fashion illustration. They're loading up their stuff to go out on this trip, and I just have to assume that's a gigantic cannon. Oh, that's a twenty-two. Like uh, like uh, that's what. That's what uh, Cable keeps in a shoulder holster. <laughs> Chekhov's cannon. We're, we'll see this fired later, I hope. There's a little bit... Boom Boom Boom's dad on camera. Look at that guy's design. Yeah. Look at his mug. This whole piece, it, it feels like uh, the guy who took over Terry and the Pirates after Milk mm -hmm. Canis was called Wonder. George Wonder. And, like, the stuff looks wet. Like, there's, like, a... Dough, doughiness to, to the artwork, man. And, and he captures that. It's like old kind of Frank Robbins kind of art. It reminds me of like a character actor in a movie chewing the scenery. It's right. almost like the character design <laughs> chewing the scenery there. Very odd. I, I do like this this art though. Like to me, it's such a clean, it's, it's a house style. It looks like uh, an old school version of like how this might have looked pre, during during the Jim Shooter era. But it's got some perversion to it, some weirdness. Yeah, like that's yeah. that's clousy and almost mm -hmm. right there. And that that cable is just very uncool. It looks like an old man. Yeah. Which I think is what cable's supposed to do. But and that that's a bad scar too, man. Bogdanov needs to get. Yeah, get the scar's a, not right. All right. So the the U.S. is basically not doing much. They they have no big. They're they're doing uh, economic sanctions. They, there's at one point we get that they're rolling an aircraft carrier into the uh, the Indian Ocean next to this to Genosha, but that's never followed up on. Like we never see any kind of uh, you know intervention by the U.S. Um, just these economic sanctions. They land on like the South Beach, man, far away from any kinds of uh, radars, but not far enough away from a little mutate snitch right there, man, who lets every lets the magistrates know that the mutants are coming. Here comes the Genotians. And when you see those circles, you know what that means, man. Cool design. Havoc's in the house. I was reading this stuff and, and was just so confused that Havoc wasn't a uh, more celebrated, popular character. He, he always seems so cool to me whenever I... Because, you know, I come in late, so I don't know his backstory. I just know when he shows up, he seems cool. So Vestry started to make him... I like him, him better than Cyclops. Yeah, sure. <laughs> like, it, it was... Uh, Jim Lee from this era, I feel like that made him cool. It could be, And yeah. it's certainly in this issue. Like, this issue I read a million fucking times. I also always liked uh, Roberto. Yeah, Sunspot, man, which is the, just a the pitch black. I like the like the Kirby dots around him and stuff. Yeah. Yeah, he was, yeah, I thought that was a cool design. Yeah, his, and it's like we're introduced, you and I are introduced to Sunspot, like, with this kind of design, and then when you see what he looked like before, and how it was just, like, a black silhouette with, like, Kirby dots, like, that throws you for a loop a bit. I like that the uh, Summers brothers are getting naked and rolling around. I know, Kane versus Abel, man. Sword fighting. <laughs> just punching each other, just like knocking each other's gear off. Yeah, ripping each other's clothes off. And, and you could just like... Uh, uh. <laughs> and then it's funny, it's like these two brothers are fighting to the death <laughs> and there's like bonk, conk. I think the more accurate automatopoeia would be... <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I think that's the onomatopoeia of some of the readers. <laughs> <laughs> Poor Rain. She's she's in a cell. Uh, boom, boom, running around through ductwork. Richter is taking a subterranean approach. It's a good. That sewer's a really good shot. I like it. I, yeah. It reminds me of Kirby, and I like how fill it up, fill it up with words. There's a couple of these pages. I, I we probably missed it where it's like there's four characters. Every one of them has multi thought balloon bubbles in the same panel where it's like. You get to read at least four characters' thought bubbles, and none of them say anything. No, yeah. That's that divorce between writer-artist where, like, the writer wants to shine, the artist wants to shine. Like, it's it's embarrassing, actually. I remember hearing DC outlawed the uh, thought balloon at some point. This is, the, this is your evidence. This is why you go, hey, we can't do this. <laughs> this is my issue, man. Yeah, I mean, Wolverine, Jim Lee on the cover, like, setting the tone for this thing. Just Once again, like, Hodge, when, what do you look like, dude? When you see this on the rack... 
you ha you have to pick this up. It's like, what is this guy? Like, I don't even know what I'm looking at. The hair is crazy. It's wires. Like, he's got like a GI Joe um, missile launcher. He's a spider. <laughs> what the fuck is this? And then reading this, like, I took stuff so weird, so like literally, and like this right here. I was like, why does she have red hair in this panel? Why does she have black hair in this panel? What, like, what is, like, I made me so confused. I was, like, eight years old when this came out, and I'm just like, what? And I'm like, oh, these are different characters? How about Wolverine sitting there? That doesn't even look like a stogie. Like, he's just having a cigarette. Yeah, man, listen, he's not going to get lung cancer because he's got that healing factor. Yeah, he's not going to survive the Quesada rain. I had these shits. <laughs> the worst controls ever. You basically have to, like, sit them right against the center in order for them to work. Are these dudes supposed to be like Fred Savage and, and his brother from Wonder Years? Good call. I think this is Wayne. I think that might be the same dude. Hey, good call, man. Maybe. Maybe. It seems too coincidental to not be intentional. But that's definitely the uh, stunt double for your yes. Fred Savage. Yeah, yeah. Not, not Fred Savage there, but I think the other dude might be Wayne. Man, I love this issue. So much, man. And, and this is like, this is where Jim Lee is like, I'm getting fucking five thousand dollars a page for on the open market it's for these so things, action man. packed like it's so dynamic richter boom boom getting chased by the genotians enter stage left wolverine jubilee psylocke uh, after their kind of cup of coffee through madripoor uh betsy braddock you know a couple issues ago was a pink hair it was in a pink haired british caucasian body now she is in a purple-haired Asian assassin body. Who loves Electra? <laughs> right. Yeah, I know, man. Like, Jim Lee. Every page, man. I love Relentless, this. baby. This, this, this burnt into my brain. Like, I, I have a tattoo version of that in my brain from staring at this panel, copying it, loving it, trying to figure out what is the back anatomy here. <laughs> oh, absolutely, man. But, he, but it looks fine, you know? Like, it's great. It's, Jim Lee, like, figures out the main shape and then realizes that you just do a bunch of hair braids and... And it's sick. Also, Scott Williams, arm hair on point this issue. <laughs> I think he really figured it out at this issue. Top 10 arm hair. Yes. And Psylocke rounding out this page, like, there's your money shot page. Oh, yeah. If, if he's selling the rest of them for $5,000, this is a $20,000 page. Oh, uh, Jim, don't jump the gun, man. There might be a couple more. I ain't saying this one is. I love this so much. Like, the impact of that's so great. He, he has detail and action. And the combination just was better than everybody else's. Yeah. And he would even draw like those, those uh, you know, like the generic magistrates looked cool. They did, yeah. Like the, the outfits. When he would, and this is... He drew at, gloves better than everybody else? This is at this period because Scott Williams is going to become way more plastic with the textures. Like on the very first issue, uh, we saw a young Storm with that fuzzy kind of aviator jacket. And it was like really good. If that was late period Scott yeah. Williams inking that thing... It would look like a plastic shirt. Got our little recap here, man. That's Sci a nice panel Sci for, for like re reading their thoughts. Yes, good looking panel. I think this piece right here sets off like the very next. There's a couple, a couple more storylines that are going to come, like crossovers. It's going to be Executioner Song, but like the last one that kind of breaks things off for. Uh, there to be fresh X-Men, new X-Factor, is uh, the Muir Island saga. that And that goes fucking nowhere. Like, Chris Claremont is done at that point. I didn't even remember it. And it's building up, like, M Moira McTaggart starts drawing more, I mean, starts uh, looking more provocatively and mm -hmm. stuff. And I think it's probably because of this. And it might be a Chris Claremont thing, like, why did Jim Lee draw her that way? And they're trying to, like, make sense of it. Yeah, I mean, they write it out here. Whenever they hang up, there's, like, a couple of panels of them discussing, like, why was she dressed that way? <laughs> what is she doing? Look at that for, like, a cool panel uh, in the middle of nothing. This is a talking head. Yeah, yeah, definitely a bit inspired by Neil Adams for sure. Yeah. That's that's a really good piece of lighting, too. When, when Jim Lee's on, he's on, man. I used to see examples where, like, it'd be a face, like, for a drawing example, and it would just be lit all these different ways. Yeah. You know, like, like do that as an exercise. Underlight it. And... He has the best Cameron Hodge. Jim Lee does. Just, just wild looking.
Wolverine, Psylocke, they commandeer some Genosian Magistrate outfits. Get into a schmoz. Call other Genosians over to take them back to base. And, and here we... Uh, boy, this is a lot of storytelling in three pages because Havoc shows up and uh, whenever he hears that they're coming in because that's his girlfriend. And uh, when he realizes it's not her, he wants to know who's wearing her, her clothes and he's looking for payback. Yeah, like this is he's, what he's makes... He's quick to get excited. This is what makes Havoc dope like yes. like this right here is like you could dispatch wolverine that way i drew this one a bunch of times yeah that's a classic so did jim lee yeah <laughs> <laughs> i love all of the silhouettes <laughs> i think this is like uh wolverine cover number 25 yeah yeah the one where he inks himself i love this part this was one that i was really into like man it, those hands look so good the, everything just I don't know. You can just sense the anatomy's right, and mm -hmm. it's still very tense and cool looking. Yeah, yeah. Doing faces at this kind of mm -hmm. angle, very, very tough. The only other guy who does that super well was like Otomo. Yeah. Look at that. The lighting there is great. And in fact, the colorist actually does a good job, like leaving leaving that space white. Just the pathetic little Wolverine there. Uh, just it, it looks like you lost all hope. But from one panel to the next, man, because we gotta. We gotta tell some story here. Psylocke looks like such a badass through this sequence with that the, giant uh, aliens like gun. Yeah, the weight of the figure is right here. Mm -hmm. You know, she's really balancing out that heavy barrel. Got a cool, so we get a does a little barrel roll. Fantastic. Even angling the panel gutter a little bit. And Jimmy, like, that's that's good arm hair. <laughs> it is good arm hair. <laughs> and then how about how the how the costume works there like the titty part goes up but yeah i don't know i guess that's just some of rip. that's not right that's oh it is a rip okay that that makes more sense yeah is that that's xerox fun. work you think i think so yeah Pretty it's cool. some sort of manipulation like so hodge takes wolverine's best shot and yeah. then takes psylocke's best shot and no effect it, right. it doesn't even stagger him it's 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 weird how powerful he is that last page is killer yes yeah, yeah. Like, I mean, there's a lot of great shots on there for being the end of the issue. Like, look at how... This reminds me almost of Cybernary, right. uh, which I'm a big fan of. But I do love these Jim Lee silhouette panels. He, he used to do that a lot, these little tiny silhouettes. And they read, they look cool. Yeah, really good. And uh, this is Storm. She's, she's now yeah. a... Uh, she's a mutate now. Shaved head and brain white. All right, man. Back to... And, and you know, that game of telephone of of uh these things trying to coordinate like this is wolverine and psylocke mm -hmm. right here right and then you read the next issue and there they are right there costumes on looking just way different yeah and in the trade paperback that is facing pages i don't know that for sure <laughs> right, but right, you, right, you know right, what i'm right. saying like you can really it really accentuates the differences get to see you around life address and jubilee yeah and i think he doesn't draw the last issue so uh, the last New Mutants issue. So this is the last Liefeld in this crossover. Yep. Except maybe cover. Right, yeah, good cover. Yeah, I was impressed by that pose. It's 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 pretty dynamic. It's not something you're going to see Liefeld doing at Image. Yeah, right. Pretty standard Liefeld jump kick pose. You've seen, you've seen, you could just you could picture Vogue doing that. Yeah. This is a strange choice to run that across two-page spread. There's nothing particularly, no no great reason for that panel to be put there. And he'll do that often. Like that's one of the great criticisms of uh, of these guys, pretty much, um, just doing things kind of willy nilly. Joe Kubert had a lot to say about that kind yeah. of thing. This is fun. This is. Louise Simonson, this is New Mutants' time to shine. And the idea here is they have no powers, but they can still get the job done because Cable's prepared them so well. Right. It kind of cool. Keeps, you know, like we talk about the X-Men characterization. I feel like this is a pretty good one of making New Mutants different than X-Men. Like Jubilee's like, what? How, how do you guys, you don't have any powers. How do you do that? Another staple of the Image Catsman, there's always a wooden barrel to pose on. <laughs> yeah. you, he will always find one to yeah, put his a lot of warehouses. <laughs> the, uh... The the inks can't cannot be. Is it Joe Rubenstein? And uh, one of the luckiest men in comics, or T Bear. <laughs> yeah, these feel very very fast. Yeah, and they, and they probably are. The fact that Liefeld's not on the next issue, um, the crossovers, just in general, the way people would complain about them, 
good Archangel, though. No, not bad. And I would like to have seen uh, Rob Liefeld ink this piece himself, because that's that weird hatch period where he's doing his, like, Ronin hatches on the eyes, and there's just a, a Venetian blind eye, eye sockets. I, I, I spent a lot of time trying to figure that part out. Yeah. Poor, uh, poor Wolfsbane. Next. Got got the dome shaved, and that's that's a violation, man. I got sisters, man. They care about their hair. She looks really cool, though. The eyebrows and the ears like that. It's kind of a neat look for her. That lack of cod piece, man, I tell you. <laughs> I mean, it, it also like lighting it and just yes. like drawing your eye straight to it. <laughs> and the color is doing like so as well. smuggling an egg. <laughs> right. Our new mutants, man, they need to take a nap. They bust into a little apartment, and it just turns out that a Genosian magistrate is coming off their shift. I would run into every single doorway if I had something that stuck up six inches above my head. Oh, no doubt, man. Some gear, I think that's called. Ear gear. Yeah. Richter looks vicious, man. Yeah. Like that, that, that doesn't look like a hero. He's fired up. I he and Rain apparently have something going on. I don't know if they were officially... I don't think they're officially boyfriend and girlfriend because I think they've only had one kiss. But uh, they realize their their feelings for each other at the beginning of this crossover. And now Richter wants some payback. Look at that trench coat, boy. <laughs> John Woo steps in for a panel. <laughs> that trench coat. Amazing. I did forget how cool Gambit was in this time period. Rob making a trench coat without any reference. <laughs> Not easy, man. Nice little pirouette, little ballerina foot. That gambit hair is, is tough to do. This is the one page where they, or the one panel where some time's put in. Yeah. I always loved this where the faces would be blacked out. Yeah. You know, not the whole head, but just the face was in shadow. He, uh, Rob, in this issue, like, cable is always drawn really well, <laughs> like, with a lot of uh, attention and stuff. That hair, man. No wonder New Mutants was doing bad before, before Rob got there. He needs to get that boy a trim. And there it is, man. Uh, Rain, Wolfsbane. She's. I like her look like that. She's a pawn in the Genosian arsenal. All right, everybody. Most of the team's now been captured. Yep. Here's our uh, wipeout in this issue, right? Like, keep, keep that in mind. <laughs> keep that in mind. Look how poor this issue's printed. For sure. That was something I noticed on the reread. <laughs> Yeah, they're just churning these suckers out, man. It's funny to look at these things and think, like, did I have a bad copy? Were they <laughs> all bad copies? Here's here's Cable giving him his shot and just yanking a million wires. And something tells me they're down to the wire because you'd never see this in Marvel Comics where, like, the same panel's kind of, like, just, like, light-boxed and re, re, retooled. Yeah, good call. I didn't even make that. I didn't even note that. There's so much weird stuff happening. When like, you see all this kind of stuff and you yank, like, we know right. how our computers work, right? And if you disassemble, like, one little wire, one piece of solder goes out, your motherboard is going to be toast. Like, what would happen if you take out, say, a dozen? Redundancy on redundancy. It's like an uh, airplane. Like an airplane landing gear or something. Yeah, Hodge is such a weird character for that reason. You know, he takes everybody's best shot, and we'll just keep pointing them out because they keep escalating. Yeah. And he's indestructible. It's like the Terminator, but in a bizarre body. Yeah. X-Factor, uh, they're just putting dynamites everywhere, and Cyclops is going to dress up like a... Uh... Cyber Force. <laughs> <laughs> he's going to be like a mutate himself. Heat Wave, I think, is his name in Cyber Force. <laughs> They throw Jean Grey in the cell with Wolverine because Hodge is a sicko and thinks this is somehow psychologically going to be more devastating. All he wants to do is torture all of these characters. How about that face? That's a good one, man. <clears throat> that looks like a uh, horror manga. But guess what, man? All their genitals still work. <laughs> all their hormones are still in effect, man. So they're just... Might as well pass the time. And also, that's a very unfortunate blood, yes, blood pool right that there. that is true. <laughs> very unfortunate. Yeah, <laughs> this whole th there's so much weird shit in this comic. It's, it's comic book love, love making, man. It's funny to go from that super minimal page to like a gazillion lines here. <laughs> right. <laughs> As some of that explosives that you mentioned, 
Don't introduce the gun in Act 1 if you don't uh, use it in uh, Act 3. It's extremely arbitrary how, what everybody knows, how the powers work, you know, because they, they scan people's brains to find where all the bombs are planted, but then, of course, some of them uh, Forge stayed unconscious, so right. they couldn't figure that out. Bogdanov is referencing the old Dave Cockrum storm face there with the big kind of cat eyes. Looks good. Yeah. Some color holds behind her, too. Kind of a weird effect to be in the middle of part six. <laughs> it is random. Archangel shows up, takes his shot. Guess what? Not effective at all. More of that, like, George Wonder kind of line work here. It, it comes and goes. But just these muscular figures. <laughs> That's Cyclops. You know, I never think of Cyclops as, like, the ultimate warrior. And is he wearing, like, a, uh, a skull cap to get the bald look? Maybe he committed, man. <laughs> I don't think he... Well, we'll find out. <laughs> yeah, I guess so, right? Maybe it's a part of the top of the little gimmick. And he just keeps meeting Havoc and talking about how we're brothers. <laughs> and he keeps uh, incrementally knocking a little sense into him. Yeah. Here's where he gets through, but Havoc doesn't want anybody to know that he got through. Yeah. This is where he flips him. Yeah, the heel turn. The face turn. The face turn. The face turn, yeah. Yeah. All right. So, okay, so stop at this point for a second. What we have seen is, I think, three issues in a row now, like like parts four through six, where whatever character you love shows up, takes his best shot, and ends up a prisoner. Very repetitive of reading this this week. Yes. Yeah, very one note. So now, uh, in order to avoid an international incident, they have to do a kangaroo court in Genosha to find these guys guilty so that they can proceed with due process in terms of punishment. Love the wigs, like the Tory wigs they're all wearing to, to carry on this court. But look at them thick necks, man. They did do this great Capullo cowbell exercises, man. <laughs> Yeah, and they wouldn't let She-Hulk show up to uh, represent them. Yeah, that made me think about, like, just, like, the the beauty of the natural growth of the Marvel Universe, how there's, like, two lawyer characters, even. Yeah. Was Matt Murdock on page one? No, but Punisher was. Yes. <laughs> Get that camera out of my face that, before I make you eat that camera. <laughs> yeah, like, uh, if they're guilty of their crimes, they deserve appropriate punishment. Jeez. And Reed Richards. Like, you're not going to take the, the... The Fantastic Four doesn't insert themselves into this. Yeah, they're just watching, man. That's the other peculiar part of these kind of crossovers. Where are all the superheroes? Aren't some of them buddies with the X-Men? Yeah, you always have to forget that part. Yes. Bad textures. I, and I think it's probably from the printing. Some, yeah, something tells dark. me that that uh, Scott Williams wouldn't have done, done it that thick. Because it really draws a lot of attention away from the characters. It's it's uh, fuzzy too that printing that black line. Yeah, I think that's I, I chalk that up to the printer. Yeah, we'll have to get that artist edition. And then of course the the main judge is even the most muscular cat of them all. <laughs> that dude is thick. You see what I mean? The the arm hair. It's perfect. <laughs> Wolverine was dying in the previous issue, FYI, everybody, and also I think naked. Yeah, some of the storytelling just really falls apart in a lot of ways up to this point. So they all uh, they all choose to uh, be penalized rather than turn to mutates or whatever. They become prisoners of Cameron Hodge. Yeah, they're put in his care after Wolverine's outburst, and so the you're going to give him to this psycho who is just literally going to torture them. <laughs> yeah, uh, we get the best uh, we get the best gambit moment in a minute. That's a good shot. It's just, he takes them into Thunderdome. Yes. Ties them up and then, like, let's get busy. Yeah, it's pretty far off the rails at this point. It's really taken a villain that's clearly been a villain from page one and just turning it up to, like, a 14. <laughs> right. The people around him are starting to question him, which is the saving grace of this storyline, the way the X-Men survive. Um, not just Havoc, but some of the other Genotians are turning against this monster yeah yeah there were certain fail safes from the i don't totally beginning. get this but somehow he makes archangel and wolverine fight i can't control my wings there it is right. the wings are attacking wolverine's going berserk good pose this is pretty iconic i feel like that's a pose that i don't know if it's that particular one but it's been reprinted and used different places a couple more of your jim lee silhouette gimmicks yep. 
There was a great Archangel Sabretooth fight in an X Factor issue a little bit earlier than this, but it was still that time period when I was getting into the comics. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And they looked so cool. Do you ever have these? Probably. Like, they would be at the drugstore, too, man. I remember the Warren Moon one. And I wonder if it was Jack Davis who drew these because it was very Jack Davis like. Uh, the Warren Moon one, I would redraw a bunch, and it's him holding a football jumping over the moon. All right. I do like that they acknowledge that Boom Boom and Jubilee are the same character with two, dif <laughs> with two different hairstyles. That's pretty badass. Yeah, he's good with that face, man. Like a little mojo like there. Totally. And that telescoping neck is uh very freaky. Yeah, here's the here's the cool gambit moment. Mm -hmm. You know, he's a thief. He's a lock lock picker. Somehow drops yeah. Drops the <laughs> drops the blade from his prison wallet and uh gets his ass out of there, man. Out of the clink. I like this stuff. You know, pulling that out of his leg wound with his teeth. That's fun. It it's it's ludicrous, but visually it works. Like they, they have a visual logic to it. Sure. But all for naught, by the way. Like none of it matters. <laughs> yeah. That was the frustrating part of reading this. Like no matter what everybody does, none of it makes any difference. Until this moment. Right. So and the big reveal is that Wipeout and the Gene Engineer, whenever they wiped Storm, they gave her basically Wipeout's power, which is this comic storytelling is like deuce ex machina one after the other. Yeah. Like all hope's lost because we saw Wipeout was killed, so there's no way to restore powers. Of course there is. Yes. And she's also a woman again now. Mm -hmm. So somehow that, that happens uh, between the gutters. You know, sometimes what happens between the gutters, Jim, that, that helps the storytelling uh, proceed. So basically, she touches you, you're getting your powers back, and uh, gives us a hopeful place to begin the New Mutants final issue of Extinction Agenda with uh, the great Guang Yap from Air Cell Comics. Right. Jumping in for penciling duties, man. Did a, did a few little Marvel jobs around this time. I think we saw him briefly in a Marvel Comics Presents story. I don't know what else he, he did there, but I like his air cell work. I was pretty excited to see his name in the credits. This is, man, eh, it is what it is. Nothing too exciting, but again, it could be a deadline. You know, he might have done this in three days for all I know. Yeah, yeah, the Rob Liefeld's name is not on it whatsoever. It's fine and it's serviceable, but it's not that exciting compared to some of his air cell stuff. Yeah. Also, it's Joe Joe Rubenstein is doing the inks and could be softening all That's of his, his edges, tightening up his, his art. Try to, to make it fit consistently. Look at the number of panels that he's packing into a page. Wow. Yeah, yeah. You soften the focus of your eyes. You could imagine a gray ink wash over some of that <laughs> stuff. Yes. <laughs> this is like more of that funny stuff. So you see the jacked up forge and like he will not be jacked up, you know, next in the X Factor issue. That's the Channing, Channing Tatum uh, gambit. <laughs> <laughs> With uh, um, Jason Priestley <laughs> hair. Jeez. Yeah, 1990. That's the era, man. That little white highlight doesn't quite work. No, it almost looks like a printing error. Or she was like, that booger sugar. Like you scraped the page accidentally. <laughs> And Cyclops' hair is good. We're, yeah. we're cool. Yeah, 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 yeah. This is uh this is the Extinction Agenda story is what explains the crazy looking wolf's bane from the Strowman comics. Because she's when she becomes feral, it's a different form than the old New Mutants mm -hmm. form when it's kind of like a soft wolf. Yeah, it's ludicrous what can be done and undone and what can't. Right. Like she can't be unturned from that mute mutate slave state when she's in human form right there's our wipeout guy actually doesn't look different so so guang yap rob liefeld jim lee and bogdanov all draw wipeout uh, well actually he guang yap draws the bogdanov wipeout <laughs> the real the real wipeout hey man it shows up two times i guess that's the <laughs> real one and there she is like you know your future x-factor member looking real tough a werewolf for the 90s. And Richter still looks like a putz. Yeah, it's hard to make that haircut work. 
And they, they, everybody gives it a shot. You have Jim Lee, Rob Liefeld. Nobody right. can make his haircut work. Yeah. Jim Lee draws really good banshee hair, by the way. Because uh, Guan Gap does not. It's very Pat Sajak. The Forge character is a funny one because he's also like built in Deus Ex Machina guy. Like, just give me popsicle sticks and duct tape and I'm going to be able to create an atomic bomb, get us out of here. Yeah, a lot of this storyline feels that way. Let me ask you this, Jimmy. When you start to see like the Image Comics, they would have sparks like this. Mm -hmm. How many drawings of sparks did you draw? Those are my sparks, too. Yeah, exactly. (laughs) (laughs) Biggest influence on how I draw sparks right here. (laughs) Right. (laughs) I love that shit, man. This was the era. That's kind of funny. Yeah, I was going to point that one out. That might have to be like the the thumbnail image for this or something. (laughs) A little crying wolf's face. If you don't know any better and just see that image, you might think it's Wolverine. <laughs> Same haircut and sideburns. Boom, boom, throwing suns. Oh, man. And then just everybody, like, doing their... Right there. Com- complete, you know, all the X powers yeah. going right at Hodge. And Hodge just, whatever it is, just laughs it off. There's our Dr. Moreau trying to hit him with some G.I. Joe gimmicks. That doesn't work. Yeah, that's straight out of Commando. Right. And now Hodge is on the run, and everybody's split into teams. Hodge can also phase through through uh, walls and stuff, so now everybody's uh, trying to find where he's at because he's on the run, and they want to kill him. And Jimmy, was that introduced, like, in mid-street? Just yeah, part, part seven, something like yeah, that, yeah. part six. I always felt like this was, like, some kind of subliminal uh, messaging that just says nut. <laughs> <laughs> just nut. All right, man, let's wrap up this... Uh, this, this epic storyline, dude. It feels like they didn't have an ending figured out in the beginning of this. <laughs> right? Yes, because it seems like it's building toward the, the Havoc Cyclops. Like, let's put our powers together. Let's t- take this guy on. But then it still keeps going. Yeah, it's very anticlimactic. Yeah. So we just introduced the Rain Wolfsbane character in this way. So everybody's drawn her big, small extra feral not that feral like it's going to take a couple issues to figure her out and by the way it doesn't matter how big she gets it still doesn't doesn't dent hodge in any way (laughs) man cable's worse for the wear and he's got two swollen ass black eyes man (laughs) how can you tell look at that Look, look he got stung by bees and didn't have an epi pen Getting some good faces in there. You look at this, and it's like, oh, she's getting jacked up. No, she's, like, transporting these dudes. Yeah, she's flying in that broken neck position. Yeah. There's that face. That's pretty ominous. Like, you just imagine, like, this dude, like, coming up through the floor like that with a big fucking smile on his face. Oh, he's a nightmare. It's just, I don't know. Is he the most powerful X-Men foe of all time? Because that's how he's presented, right? (laughs) Right. He has, like, every kind of weapon you can imagine. I have my arm with a blade on the end of it. Has a gun coming out of his mouth that shoots green goop. It looks like it's coming out of his tongue, like a telescoping gun straight out of the tongue. You know what's funny? I never noticed that. What is, you know, like, <laughs> what are we doing here, people? This started out as, like, some, you no know... cash and we- checks, man holocaust like storyline and now we've got a guy with a gun that squirts green stuff out of his tongue (laughs) (laughs) Ah, it's so ridiculous man we loved it we see you could find the x-men issues you could find an errant x-factor new mutants issue around this time putting it all together and reading it all together man after 20 years of build-up maybe i was glad i made the choice to jump toward like you know love and rockets comics yes. and shit after this yeah i was looking everywhere for something else <laughs> <laughs> yeah when i did my big purge i got rid of all of this except the jim lee stuff and uh it's not one i've rebought ed yeah sure well you know what i think i have two sets <laughs> so so I'll, so i'll slide one over to you Oy. look at that president man she is weird and it's mostly Bogdanov's version of her that's the most outlandish but yeah. it's a strange character design. I kind of like it. Yeah, it I might like, like her more than Hodge. It feels like Pander Brothers. Like you would see characters built that way in uh, the Grendel comics from Kamiko. She yes. looks a little bit like Rank Xerox. It does, yes. 
So here's the part, man. The brothers are together, reunited, right? So you're like, okay. Uh, you would expect that this panel would be much bigger because that's your... Are they holding hands? Listen, man, it's Wonder Twins' powers combined. They blow out... And it's uh, all this epic stuff, super tiny panels. And then they're watching. Still super tiny panels. But guess what? Like, still nothing. Yeah. He's still completely together. I always just think, like, your storm... You, you know, you could do like a an F five on this guy. Right. You, you know, you, it, it just is is strange. Like they were smart because they they take her out first. Yeah. But now everybody's restored. Like, I don't know. Hard for me to totally understand what Hodge is made out of and how <laughs> he stopped ever. Like even here, whenever they finally destroy him, he's down to his head and goes over the side of the building. I don't know if they soccer kick him or what, how they get it. I guess they eye blast him off the edge. They go over to look, and his tongue is still able to, uh, still able to fight. It's very comedic. It is really comedic. <laughs> like there's just no end to him, man. And I, I have to think that there, there's even like some disrespect of the creator, like. These kids ain't going to care. Like, like. Just, oh yeah, oh yeah. Just, it's, it's all disdain we'll for this. the readers. I really feel like it. No doubt about it. This is the stuff that Fantagraphics rail against. Like, this is just how many books can we put on the on the shelf so that the store can't order anything else? Right. Totally. So here's where it ends, man. We have Rain, who's the most transformed of all the characters uh, at this point. Her friends have died. Warlock yeah. is toast. She's gonna pick up his little head, but it's still a Marvel comic, so that's probably as like brutal as it gets. And she doesn't split the head in in half. Like I would like to have seen half the head there, half yes. the head there, a little vivisection, cross cut, receive half of the brain or something, or just the full brain just falls out of the case. That'd be nice. Anything that's flesh on his face should be gone at this point. Yeah. <laughs> and then. Richter does his little seismic power thing, crushes the Citadel. Military coup. Military coup. <laughs> Let's throw the military coup in there, man. The president, she was in league with Cameron Hodge, so they're going to establish some elections. This is fun. It's very cynical because this is her on television explaining what has gone on and how there's, you know, the president broke down mentally and stuff. And then afterwards, they're like, yeah, half-truths mixed in there. <laughs> yeah, it's all about, like, saving face and stuff. Right. There are these, like, allusions to CIA things. And, like, you could tell that, like, the writers have are interested in some things that are happening, trying to get a little something in there, but in the guise of this goofball comic. So they've been running around with Warlock's ashes as well. And they're just going to put it on Doug Ramsey's uh, gravestone. Looks like a pile of cocaine. Totally, and just give you that little glimmer that maybe he'll come back. This was uh, this was a ballsy move to like get the warlock character out of there. I think so too, because it was such a cool character. Yes. It was the the most fun piece of New Mutants. Uh, even those like Brett Blevins series, like Art Adams did amazing stuff with the with the character. Yeah, it surprises it, it surprised me rereading this that they kill him the way they do. Like it's not even a big deal. Like they just kill him. When you think when you think about like what the nineties turns into, the big guns, big boobs, tiny waist, uh bravado, the machismo, like there's no place for warlock. Like I wonder if Rob Liefeld had something to do with that. Like, you know, I'm gonna reshape new mutants and we gotta get the cartoon character out of there or something like that, man. But there sort of is no place for that character in the canon films, comics of the, the 1990s. But Jim, there there you have it in a nutshell, man. Uh, I think this series of comics is kind of as important for the speculator market as uh, as that Spider-Man number one in a different sort of way. Yeah, this is Marvel really at the height of their... Not at the height, but, but really good at selling. Yeah. that You know, I mean, it's such a sales mechanism. They promote it as, like, the biggest threat the X-Men have faced. It, it's real sad to me how how much it falls off. Like, yeah. it starts with all this promise, really cool ideas, big threat, international in scale, awesome. And by the end, it's just the silliest, you know, like like we were pointing out, the guy's fighting Alex with his tongue. Like, here's come on. Here's... Uh, the points that this crossover gets that some of those earlier ones do not. So, like, Mutant Massacre, or, like, Inferno, 
you almost don't even know what the stakes are. Like, you know that Madeline Pryor, she's a clone, like, like uh, the Nastir demon gargoyle thing is pulling this trip, but you don't even really know why. I'm sure people are going to be like, oh, but this, 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 and this, and I'm like, well, you read the Wikipedia, or you read some comic <laughs> yeah. that came out in 2000 to, to explain it. Uh, it is extremely unclear, so they at least tried to make something work uh, here. I think that this crossover did a ton like like Rob Liefeld was the was the wonder kid right but I think this even though these are weak issues compared to the very next you know 90 yeah 98 like we're going to introduce De Deadpool yeah. next next issue man uh this is like uh a great introduction to to Rob Liefeld to to a whole lot of people uh I knew uh I knew Jim Lee from Punisher, but this put Jim Lee on a lot of people's radar. So we're setting up Image Comics, I feel like, with this crossover. Yeah, and we're also setting up 1991. Yeah. Because whatever, you know, people knew Jim Lee, but this was next level. People were starting to know Rob Liefeld. This is next level. Yeah. It was all of those things of, like I said, Wills Protasio, I think, joins X Factor right after this. This was kind of a. Uh, Jay Lee's going to do a, some a soft looks. relaunch of the X books in a lot of ways, where it's like we've got A listers on all the books after this, and they do come out really firing. Like, I love the post Extinction Agenda X Men. Like, for the next several issues, it's really, really like one strong issue after another. You mentioned New Mutants coming up 98, 99, 100 is like the whole pre X Force stuff. It just really comes out of here with, I don't know, a renewed energy. And I think sales reflected that. Like, all these artists just take off. It's it's It could be, you know, what comes first, chicken or the egg? Is it the speculator market's in full swing and these guys happen to be at the right place, right time? Are they responsible for the speculator market? Is it a little bit of each side, you know, contributing to that? But whatever it is, like, this is the beginning of... Uh, the rocket ship's taken off at this point. I don't know if it's the very beginning, but it's certainly, like, moving. Like, the momentum, this is a huge momentum book on that movement to what becomes Image Comics. And I hope everybody made note of the, the ads in the book, too, because the way the speculator boom is described in retrospect is that, you know, the adults, they first cannibalized the trading card industry, and there were at least a half dozen trading card ads in like each issue very true you know so we're still at the height of the uh the trading card bubble when i, I would have been getting these books i've never heard of comic shops or comic cons i have to switch other covers up <laughs> <laughs> but uh there would be at the local mall there there would be like trade shows of trading cards for a while, it was trading cards predominantly, and it would be on the main promenades, right? And just a million dealers, mm -hmm. million cards, super expensive, just just greasy, gross dudes <laughs> taking money from little kids. It's very just true. Just taking so much allowance money off of kids and laughing all the way to the bank. And then around this time, like, this is all so clear in my mind, man. Like, around this time, a lot of cards still, but we have a couple of long boxes now. And then a couple more of long boxes and then comic shops are bigger and all that stuff man so i think these this era of comics helped the mainstream comics publishers stagger around into where they are now basically you know what i mean they've been coasting off a of 1990s substance uh and all the sales from from that era um all this time you know there hasn't been another big blip or strike uh like this since then yeah, especially for the comic book format. Yeah, that's for, that's for damn sure. That's for damn sure. Anyhow, man, I'm pooped after uh, checking this yeah, wow. thing out. Yeah, wow. Me get, too. Get out of here. Mm -hmm. Gay favors. Like, follow, subscribe to the YouTube channel. Hit the bell. We'll notify you when new vids are available. You can find more of my work at patreon.com slash jimrug. Uh, lots of original art, lots of process posts, and currently uh, comparing you know, two, two issues of Street Angel, Alpha and Omega of the Image Street Angel series. <laughs> Red Room is going to be a monthly comic, and it's going to come out uh, beginning May 2021. Reserve your copy right now through the Fantagraphics website. Uh, your store is going to be able to order it, though, if you have a good store to support. Uh, tell them to order copies at the end of February or later. Like I said, it's going to be a monthly comic. It's uh, every issue self-contained. Uh, if you want to read those issues right now, hit, hit my Patreon, patreon.com slash edpiscor. I have a link tree in the description below where you can get to all that stuff.
You can subscribe to the Cartoonist Kayfabe e-newsletter at the links below this video to keep up with everything we have going on. Seems like 2021 is getting busier and busier for Cartoonist Kayfabe. You don't want to miss anything. That's the best way to keep up. You can also find Cartoonist Kayfabe t-shirts and merchandise at links below this video. Jimmy, give them the merchant orders. We're going to be on our way. Read more comics. But not Extinction Agenda or, or uh, any X-Men issues after 300. <laughs>